I'll get straight to the point. Living Hope's plans to expand our ministry include an expansion to our facility, and we're conducting a capital campaign in order to fund that expansion. We want growth in faith to play an integral role in that, in that campaign, and that's the purpose of this video. In it, we're going to dig into the longest section in the New Testament on Christian giving. It's 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And by the end of the study, it's my prayer that, that you'll agree with me that there are some valuable gems in this passage. Now, if you have even one cynical bone in your body, you may hear it rattling around something to the effect of, if we're going to get straight to the point here, then let's get down to dollars and cents. Because we already all know that God wants us to be generous, so we don't need a Bible study guilt trip. That's precisely what might surprise us most about these chapters. The Apostle Paul is conducting a capital campaign, and he's writing to a congregation that was falling short of its original intention. But his message is not, hey guys, we all know that God wants us to be generous, so dig deep and fork it over. He doesn't push or pull or pry. There are no guilt trips. Instead, to prompt their generosity, he spends these chapters singing to them about God's generosity. Or the word that he likes to use, grace. We know grace, that special word for God's undeserved love in action. Over the 260 chapters of the New Testament, it occurs 155 times. If you do the math, that's over one time every two chapters. But if that seems like a lot, in just these two chapters, Paul uses it 10 times. It's kind of like he's trying to make a point that grace is the organizing principle of Christian giving. That any gracious giving we do begins and ends with God's gracious giving. God is generous to us so that he can be generous through us. Let's start with a quick overview of what was going on here. The Apostle Paul was an Israelite through and through. But almost all of his mission work that we know about in the Bible takes place outside of Israel. Most of it on the northern edge of the Mediterranean Sea in present-day Greece and, and Turkey. The book of Acts tells us about three extensive missionary journeys through those lands that Paul went on. Now, if we zoom in a little bit from there, we don't know all the details, but around 55 AD, the, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem were having a really hard time just meeting their basic needs, and their problems seem to have been the result of a combination of famine and persecution. Paul sees an opportunity for Christian love here. He appeals to congregations he had founded on his missionary journeys to gather an offering in order to help them out. This offering would serve two purposes at least. First, it would provide for the material needs of Christians in poverty. Second, it would be a demonstration of Christian unity, that Christian congregations composed heavily of Gentiles way out on the frontier, that, that they would participate in this effort to help Jewish Christians in the heartland. That was a big deal. It would be this loud and clear message that the work of the Christian church isn't carried out in silos. Christian congregations are families that, that help each other out. The wider Christian church is a family, too. The plan was for each congregation to gather its contribution to the offering. Then Paul and his colleagues would visit the churches, gather the money, and then deliver the combined sum to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. So now let's zoom in on Corinth. Even though the Christian church in Corinth had more than its fair share of internal problems, still from the very beginning they were very eager to get on board with this effort. But as of late, what had started out strong was beginning to fizzle. One of the reasons Paul writes 2 Corinthians is to encourage them to finish what they started. And the word that Paul wants to impress on their hearts is grace. Right now, I would encourage you to hit pause and read these two chapters. Even if you're a slow reader, it shouldn't take more than six minutes. In the rest of the video, we're going to dig deeper, and we're going to uncover some gems, 
through which God will, will also equip us, like he did the Corinthians, to, um, as in Paul's words, to excel in the grace of giving. Here are the three gems we'll uncover. God's grace in others, God's grace in Christ, and God's abounding grace for our giving. Gem number one, God's grace in others. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. This is the longest section I'll read in this study. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. Paul opens his encouragement to the Corinthians by pointing them to the giving of others. That may not seem right to us. In our society, income and finances and giving are the most private aspects of life. But, but that's what Paul chooses to lead with. There's some geography going on here. Corinth was in the region of Achaia. Macedonia was the neighboring region to the north. You may be familiar with the names of some of the Macedonian cities from other books of the Bible, like Philippi, Thessalonica. The Macedonians were not congregations with deep pockets. Apparently, Paul hadn't even asked them to participate in the offering. He probably thought that they just weren't in a financial position to give. But when the Macedonians heard about the plan, they urgently pleaded with Paul for the privilege of participating. So why does Paul tell the Corinthians about the Macedonians' giving? At first, it might strike us as a guilt trip. Like, hey, if, if those guys can give, you definitely can. But that's not it at all. Notice Paul doesn't say, brothers, we want you to know about how much the Macedonians gave. No, what he's highlighting is what the Macedonians received. Brothers, we want you to know about the grace God has given the Macedonian churches. He's pointing them to God's giving, God's love at work in the hearts of these poverty-stricken Christians manifested in their giving. Paul is telling the Corinthians, you see what God worked over there in Macedonia? I'm confident that God will also work the same thing in you. Something else worth mentioning here. If we jump ahead to the beginning of the next chapter, we see that this encouragement went in both directions. Paul says to the Corinthians, For I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. So first, the Corinthians' enthusiasm stirred the Macedonians to action, then the Macedonians' giving would stir the Corinthians to action. But the source of it all was the same. The source of it all was God's love at work in their hearts. Remember, any gracious giving we do begins and ends with the gracious giving God does. The second gem, God's grace in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Paul takes us out of our comfort zones again. The rich generosity of the poor Macedonians is still on his mind when he says to the Corinthians, I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. To paraphrase, he says, I want you Corinthians to put your money where your love is so that the genuineness of your love might be just as obvious as the Macedonians is. 
The Corinthians giving would be visible proof of their invisible love. The cynic in us might see that as another guilt trip, like the teenager who says to his parents, if you really love me, you would buy me an iPhone 11 Pro just like my friend's parents are doing. But that's not Paul's style. The reason he wants to see the genuineness of their love, it's not a ploy to pry more cash out of their tight fists. No, he's confident to compare the Corinthians with the Macedonians because they're all drawing their love and their life from the same source. They live in different regions of Greece, and they may contend with different circumstances, but the source of their love is the same. Because Just like the Macedonians, you Corinthians know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You Corinthians are are living off of the same grace as the Macedonians, the transformative grace of God that has completely changed the motives of your hearts. And then once you get into verse 9, Those Macedonians, they fade into the background, and it's just the Corinthians and Jesus. They knew grace. That God in heaven, the maker and owner of all, comes down into this world and empties himself of power and wealth and dignity until all of it's gone and he's hanging on a cross. There, Jesus Christ is poor because he's got nothing. No support, no strength, no no undergarment, no father to call on. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's got nothing to call his own but sin. And if that's all there were to it, you'd have to call that a pity. But that's not all there was to it. For your sakes he became poor. If it's just God on a cross, that's a tragic pity. But if it's God on a cross for you, that's grace. How's this for an illustration of grace? This is Jesus. This is you. You've got nothing to offer God or anyone else but sin and selfishness. You've got no good reason for God to give you anything good. But God still gives his best. He gives you his best. And Jesus pours himself out on the cross to take away your sin and restore you to God. And if you have God on your side, that's everything. You're rich. That's why Paul would delight to see the genuineness of the Corinthians' love. It's not so that he can make sure that they actually have love in their hearts. It's because he knows that they have it. And this would be an opportunity for them to allow God's rich generosity to them to overflow out of themselves to others. It's the reason why they were still in the world. God is generous to us so that he can be generous through us. The last gem that we want to dig up and marvel at is God's abounding grace for our giving. The thinking may go like this. It's not that I don't have the desire to give. I just don't have the cash. Finances are already so tight to begin with. I just can't afford it like some other people. But hey, if I win the lottery, you can count me in. We don't have to read very far between the lines to see that that's precisely the thinking that was causing the Corinthians' original enthusiasm to fizzle out. Call it a mindset of scarcity. Now, they very well may have fallen on their own hard times, and if you barely have enough for yourself, it seems to border on irresponsibility to give it away for others, especially perhaps in this situation where their offering was going for people a half a world away that they didn't even know. We can understand their apprehension. We live in a world of limited resources. We can't say yes to everything. But still, the Apostle Paul, he doesn't counsel them to make sure to squirrel enough away for themselves before they start thinking of anyone else. In fact, 
Remember the very beginning of chapter 8, he begins his encouragement to the Corinthians by pointing them to the Macedonians, who definitely didn't have enough for themselves, but still pleaded with Paul for the opportunity to give it away to others. Let's look at a couple things Paul says to counter that scarcity mindset of we don't have enough to give. Chapter 8, verse 12. If the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. That is to say that generosity isn't measured in absolute dollars and cents. Christian generosity is a matter of the heart, and it's a matter of proportion. We can't help but think about the the widow at the temple with her two small copper coins. Rich people were pouring in boatloads of money into the temple treasury. But Jesus declared that she gave more than all of them because she gave all she had to live on. Is the teenager who gives $20 from their part-time check any less generous than the millionaire who gives $200,000 from their IRA? That's not the way Jesus measures an offering. But the millionaire makes more of a real-world difference. I would think twice before jumping to that assumption. God has his ways of creating big things out of little things. He feeds the 5,000 with the little boy's lunch. He's still using the widow's might and the poor Macedonians to inspire Christian generosity 2,000 years after they gave what hardly anybody else noticed at the time. Scarcity is not in the vocabulary of the creator of heaven and earth. He gives the desire to give, he gives the means to give, and he uses what we give. Chapter 9, verses 8 and 9. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, He has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. You can find just about everything in that promise except scarcity. All grace, all things, all times, all that you need, every good work, it all abounds. It's a promise to skeptical Christians who look at their bank accounts and all they see is how much they don't have. Two small copper coins five loaves of bread and two small fish, what difference will it make? But the God who made billions of stars burst into existence in an instant and who still puts the oxygen in my every breath, he says, you don't think I can make it make a difference? Do you think that I'm going to respond to your trust by failing you? Try me. You won't find scarcity. You'll find abundance. When we look at ourselves and our pocketbooks and think, I just can't. Well, God's response isn't, you're able. His message is, God is able. He wraps this up with a zinger. A verse from Psalm 112. He has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. We might pass over that quickly as a proof passage about how generous God is. His abundant giving bears fruit into eternity. But in order to get the zing, we need to look at that verse in its context. Psalm 112 is not about God's generosity. It's about ours. The he and the his, that's talking about you. Whether you're the teenager with the part-time job or the millionaire with the IRA, God has given it to you so that he can give it through you. And he'll keep on giving you enough to give. God is able. And he'll, and he'll make it make a difference. How he chooses to do that is up to him. He has his ways. But however God chooses to bless it, its effects will bear fruit into eternity. Whether it's simply the eternal honor in heaven of having served as God's instrument of grace on earth, or whether it's other people in heaven who will have heard the gospel 
or return to the gospel or groan in the gospel because of what God did through you. God has his ways. You have his promise. Your capital campaign committee has selected not unto us as the theme of this campaign. You may recognize it as the title of a hymn we sing several times a year, and that hymn in turn is inspired by a psalm that we also sing several times a year. Psalm 115. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. We hope you agree that that theme fits well with 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and its foundation of grace. Grace is all over the Bible, but it abounds in these chapters. Without grace, we would have nothing to offer God but sin. But God offered himself for us. And then he graciously sought us out by sending people to us with word and sacrament. And now grace upon grace, he invites us to join him in that same work. And he alone gives us the desire to join him and the material means to contribute to the work and the promise that he will use it to make a difference that will last literally forever. God's not barking a command here. Be generous. He's telling us how much he gives grace to us and through us. And say five years from now, Say God chooses to bless our work and our gifts with such visible fruit that we're able to touch three times as many people with the gospel as we do now. And say our facility has grown from 4,000 to 12,000 square feet and we've got an overflowing Mornings with Mommy program and we're reaching out to the community with God's only solution for breaking and broken relationships and we're supporting the worldwide work of our church body even more. If God chooses to bless our work and our gifts in such a way, I imagine that Psalm 115 will be the perfect way to celebrate. Imagine a special service with a roaring organ and a pitch-perfect choir. But we're not patting ourselves on the back. Oh, we did it. We did it. Psalm 115. Not unto us, O Lord not unto us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. Thanks for watching the video. May the God of all grace richly bless our work. We have his promise.